when everything came crumbling down, we found out we had a Stasi spy on the base. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list to keep up with the latest episode. Trevor Howey's roller RAF Gatow was advising the station commander on station defence during times of war, tension or terrorist threat, as well as the defence of the 26th Signals Unit at the Teufelsberg listening post. RAF Gatow's western side was located right against the Berlin Wall, which was clearly visible from the control tower. Beyond the wall was the Doberitz training area for the Soviet and East German Army. Soviet jets regularly overflew West Berlin, emitting sonic booms to underline the immediate threat from their forces. To gain intelligence about the opposition, Trevor used the resident de Havilland chipmunk aircraft to see across the wall and observe the neighbouring Soviet and East German forces. He describes the defence plans and exercises, such as Exercise Grizzly Bear, where every member of the air station would have played a part in its defence. He also vividly describes how he heard when the wall opened on the 9th of November 1989. It's a fascinating view of British forces in Berlin and their plans should the Cold War have turned hot. Now, Cold War history is disappearing, but a simple monthly donation will help keep this podcast on the air. You'll be part of our community, you'll get a sought-after Cold War Conversations coaster as a thank you, and you'll bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. Hi, I'm Sean from Perth, Western Australia, and I support the Cold War Conversations podcast because these are the real stories of the world I grew up in, and we are uniquely privileged to record the experiences and thoughts of the people who are actually part of the shaping of our lives. If a monthly contribution is not your cup of tea, we also welcome one-off donations via coldwarconversations.com slash donate. I'm delighted to welcome Trevor Howey to our Cold War conversation. So in 89, my desk officer had phoned up and said, look, we're looking at posting you, Trevor. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's good. Where, where are you looking at? He says, well, we've got RAF Gatow or we've got Gibraltar. I went, ooh, two interesting little tours. Uh, I had to speak to uh, the wife about it, and I thought, ah, oh, we'll go, we'll go to, we'll go to Gatow, I think. Now, RAF Gatow is the the RAF base in in Berlin. That's our air base in Berlin. So we had it off on October the third or fourth. Got the ferry across, drove all the way through, uh, went through the usual route of. Um, Helmstedt uh, through Marienborn up up to uh, along the uh, the Autobahn up to Checkpoint Bravo and then in. So we arrived in in RAF Gatow, which is located in the southwest of the uh, of of Berlin of West Berlin, right up abutting against the wall. You know, and uh, we got Montgomery Barracks is just below us, and next to the town of Kladau uh, on the other side of the Havel and uh, the Vance. So, yeah, in, uh, after three years with the police, I was posted to, to Berlin in early October 1989 to start a, a tour as, uh, as the, the, the station regiment officer at Gatow. What does the station regiment officer do? Um, I have a small team. I have a sergeant and, and two corporals. And our role there is basically to train all the RF personnel in their wartime role in how to defend the station, skill at arms, nuclear, biological, chemical, first aid, internal security, counter-terrorism, you know, because we, we still have an IRA threat. And, uh, and uh, in Germany, we also had the Red Army faction and, the, and those there. And also within Berlin, we had the uh, uh, Turkish terror groups within, within there. So our role there was, um, was to, to train all the RAF personnel on how to defend themselves and defend the station during wartime. My specific role as well was to advise the station commander on how we defend the station. I also had a, I was responsible, I was the station fire officer, so I had 30 German firemen who were under my command um, there who did the, the, the station crash and domestic fire. 
and we also worked closely with the the RF police and the Protestant security services that were there to to counter any terrorist threat. But being in Berlin and with the wall, our terrorist threat from our normal terrorist threat spectrum of the Irish terrorists was was quite low for us. Whereas down in the zone, it was active, especially in the 80s and the late 80s there, because we'd had quite a number of people killed because there was an active service unit operating in the uh, uh, down the zone at that time. So that was very active over there. Whereas for us, the, the terrorist side was not big, but Berlin was a hotbed of political dissent. It, it had a massive population, a student population that were you know, not enamoured with the military in any way or governments or anything like that. It was a, quite an anarchic collection of people, especially down Kreuzberg area and places like that. So it was a hotbed of, of political dissent as well, you know, which for us probably would have been a bigger, you know, threat as in, you know, disturbances and that potentially against military. Yep. So I, I was posted over yeah. there for a three-year tour to, to basically look after the defence of the base uh, and to train them to organise exercises, plan exercises, uh, so that we could uh, practice that. You're right up against the wall. I think you're right up against Doberitz training area, which is an yeah. East German Army training area. So the the position itself is probably one of the most vulnerable. All of us were pretty close to the wall because we all hugged that um, that that western side. Yeah, you know, the Berlin Infantry Brigade were all on that western side of the wall. We were right up against the wall, as was um, Montgomery Barracks below us. They were right up against the wall on the southern side as well. We had a, the edge, then you had the Potsdamer Chaussee, and then you had the wall. You had all the goon towers, you know, that overlooked the uh, the, the airbase 24-7, and then you had the, the very large Doberitz training area, which was a tank and artillery training area with the barracks there as well. Uh, right beside uh, beside us. So you're being observed all the time. So they can basically see almost all the operations that are going on. Yes, on the base. Yes, yeah. Because you had the the watchtowers, you had the runway, and then you had all of our hangars, from hangar one through to my hangar, hangar six. And then around the corner, you had hangar seven, eight, which they probably couldn't see all that well. But yeah, all the main ones, the main operations. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And what what were the defensive plans if the the balloon went up and they 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 came over? What what were your options there for defence? We had we would get a company of one of the resident battalions come in. For us, it was a company, Ross Fusiliers, when we were there to assist in the defence of the base um, during time of threat. Obviously, any threat spectrum has there's a build up. You know, so you, you'd build up your defences there and you would get the army in to, to assist us on that. And then we have our own personnel. But in reality, there's not a lot there, you know, to defend that. You'd obviously carry out. We, we obviously, because we weren't a main operating base, we didn't, we didn't have air assets that we were looking at. We had other strategic installations with radar squadron on the, the base there. And then obviously you had T-Berg up the hill. Um, but probably the most sensitive and, and, and the most important asset on the base would have been the radar squadron, you know, their number in four hangar in their operations. And that was, you know, intelligence gathering, you know, that they were doing in there. So for us, you know, we weren't carrying out air operations or anything like that. We had that role with, uh, you know, intelligence gathering, you know, with the hill and, and four hangar. So I think our survivability rate would have been pretty slim, though, we did have a bug out plan to take station personnel from obviously if the base became untenable we would then move out of the base across the harvel and into the city center to amalgamate and and uh, the the um berlin infantry brigade plan and assist in the defense of the british sector as basic foot soldiers on in trenches within an urban environment and we used to practice that as well you know, that we used to practice bugging out of the station across the harbour on the heavy ferries um, and into the woods and down to Doughboy City to dig into, you know, what was left of World War Two Berlin. <laughs> well, we come back, we come on to digging up bits of World War Two Berlin in a in a little while. 
one, one thing that was interesting beforehand was uh, before the wall came down was used to get the Russian air crews to fly over sonic and we used to get sonic booms especially at night and they'd fly over and you just get sonic booms bang 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 and they did that deliberately and then you'd also at night they do most of their artillery range work at night so you just have massive artillery barrages going down during the night just as psychological warfare on the russians part the western group of forces there but yeah it was interesting to have them flying over yeah because i think what people don't realize is there was this berlin air control zone that allowed both the soviets and the british french and american to uh fly in that 20 mile zone around the the center of berlin and then there were obviously the air corridors the the helicopters weren't allowed out seven flight army air corps weren't allowed outside of the uh the wall but the chipmunks could fly within the uh the the, the zone there so they'd be up exercising our right to to fly within that uh that area did you go up in the chipmunks and have a look around just to see what the uh opposition looked like the other side of the wall yep certainly did yeah very early on i organized a, a trip up in the chipmunk for a couple of hours and uh flew completely around Berlin, yeah, just looking at the various Russian and uh, East German installations within there so I, I could get a feel for the ground, you know, and, that I'm looking at because when I arrived there, my it was hectic because I arrived my first week, we had a recall exercise because the Royal Welsh Fusiliers were on exercise down in the zone and uh, they all had to go down to do their normal, you know, because you couldn't train within Berlin on a battalion size or company size so they'd go down to you know Senelaga or Saltau Lunenburg training areas so they could you know carry up their their wartime training and the first week I got there we had the major recall where they recalled the whole battalion back which I had to take control of down in Gatow uh, for my element and that involved 10 Hercules coming back at 30 minute intervals that was my first week, so I hit the ground running, basically, then. And it didn't stop for quite a while, to be honest. Um, I, I didn't think, I think three months in, I didn't think I was going to survive the tour, what with the the workload and the social life that was huge in Berlin. Jan and I, by December, thought we're going to die. I've always heard that Berlin is one of the most popular postings and that the um, the attractions of, uh, of living in a city like that were uh, considerable let's say it's an incredible city in berlin you could go you could go to the the philharmonie like we did and see simon rattle you know doing sibelius you know or you could go over to the east and uh, and and go to the Staatsoper and see you know figaro or you could go and see the ballet and that and then you could go down to Charlottenburg to the Grotz and go and see adult entertainment in Montcheries or the Starlight or Big Sexy Land or whatever. You know, Berlin catered for every taste known to man and beast, <laughs> basically. It was a phenomenal place. <laughs> it was it, it was extraordinary. It was a wonderful city. Uh, and you're 105 miles within the inner German border. You're in enemy territory, surrounded by... The Western group of forces, you know, and you had the Berlin budget, which was you basically what you wanted, you got. It was extraordinary place to be that way. The lowdown was you, you had things like in Germany, they still had uh, national service. So you had those that didn't want to do national service in Germany, they could go into the civil service and do their two years in that, or they could suddenly go to university and that in Berlin. And you found all and the reason why I said there was such a, a big anti-establishment um, group within there is a lot of those came into Berlin uh, within there. So that made life interesting as well, you know, because it was just so diverse in the, the city. It was a magnificent place uh, at that time. I say unique. You know, you, it's the only city in the world I know where the sun rises in the east and sets in the east. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd agree. I mean, I was lucky enough to get there in 89 before it all changed and i'm so pleased that i saw the city as it was as a di divided city an amazing place absolutely amazing
I had to get out to the east really quickly. I only went out to the uh, within, I think, the first weekend, I think, I, I took a tour because we used to do organized tours, uh, especially for the new people coming in and their families so they could go and see Berlin. It was an induction tour for Berlin, West Berlin, and then you went to the east. And I had to do that before I got inducted into 26SU and four hanger uh, because after that I wasn't allowed to go east um, at all as none of them were. And uh, so I got off there and, and got to see, you know, took the trip out and places like Alexanderplatz and Treptow to the big war memorial there, the Neuerwacker and sort of changing the guards. And that was an interesting experience. I was I was spat on a couple of times by a couple of old and bold gentlemen, obviously World War Two vintage because we're all dressed in Best Blue's number one uniform, RAF uniform, and obviously the the Air Force was not exactly, you know, liked by that uh, that ilk because of what we did. We bombed the hell out of the, the country. And then I had a couple of girls gave me grief, but generally speaking, it was it was fine. But that was an interesting experience going to the East because it was just such a huge contrast to the, the West. Once you got out of the Unter den Linden and, and, and Alexanderplatz and you got one or two blocks either side, it was back to World War II Berlin, basically. It was, uh, it was an interesting, the, the difference between the two sides of the wall was, uh, was quite extraordinary. And you weren't allowed to travel over there after that because you were a keeper of secrets of that hangar well i wasn't but i was privy i i was instrumental looking at their defense and i could go into their organizations that when you went into teberg you know even though i'd been inducted into it i had to be escorted everywhere i had a big badge on saying visitor you know (laughs) unclean and there'd be red lights flashing in every corridor basically to tell all of those in there that there was someone that was not cleared to their level because obviously the need to know principle there was was huge even amongst departments you know so even though i've been inducted into it for because i i needed to be to to plan their defense and to look after them um yeah i wasn't privy to any of their information or any of their operations and i wasn't interested in trying to know i had many friends who worked there i never asked them a single question about their work no one did you know because it would have been rude to do so because they just wouldn't yeah, you'd just be foolish to do so. So, but yeah, going walking then all the red lights. Are, rrr, rrr, rrr. Yeah, but uh, yeah, and that was it. Once that was done, yeah, that was me. I wasn't allowed to go east, and you know, no one in the hangar or up at Tebow was allowed to go east once they were in that job. There was a um a ski slope down one side as well. Uh, Pete, they used to German Berliners used to go skiing down there in the winter uh, from Tebow, but. And they used to fly kites there during the summer. There's just hundreds and hundreds of kites on Teberg because there was two levels. Uh, Teberg itself was uh, the, the the hill uh, was on the the highest point, but then it dipped down, and there was another big flatter hill where everyone used to fly kites, and it had the most magnificent view of Berlin. It was a place to go on New Year's because you used to sit up there and you could see the whole of Berlin erupting because the Germans loved their fireworks. And I mean, with Teberg in time of war, what what were the plans for defending it? Was it just basically destroy as much as you can before the the Russians arrived? Oh, that that's for them. That that would have been their plans, and I wasn't privy to that. Um, but destruction would have been a, a major part of it. Even in Gatow, down at the uh, uh, the operations center, there outside in the corridor was the most massive paper shredder equipment shredder if you've ever seen it was huge it was on an industrial scale and things would just be you know put into there and, and ground up one of the interesting things at, at that time because you're in berlin is you had to assume that your phones were not secure well they weren't secure we had a secret phone in the headquarters where if you needed to um to communicate Immediately in, in anything classified, you could use that. Otherwise, you use signals for classified. So when you were phoning down the zone, you have always had to remind people that um, that your phone wasn't secure and talk in veiled speech or if there was anything important, you put on a signal. When everything came crumbling down, we found out we had a Stasi spy on the base at that time who had worked in the 
officers mess for many years as a mess manager and then he in his latter decade or so worked as the deputy public relations officer in the headquarters and was in on lots of meetings with all the Germans and that as a translator and things. Um, when he was arrested, he informed us that there were six phones on the, the station that had been bugged by the Stasi. One of them was mine in the uh, station regiment officer's um, office. What we used to also used to have is once a year, the, uh, the British Services Security Organization, BSSO, used to come over and take over my hangar and run exercises and operations out of my hangar and there were special little jacks and phone plugs and that in my office that I never used, and they obviously used. Uh, so it must have been rather enlightening them afterwards when uh, our little Stasi spy revealed that my office was one of the ones that was uh, was bugged by the Stasi. Wow, wow! And the BSSO, what I've not, I don't think I've heard of British Services Security Organisation. What was their their role? Their role was probably counterintelligence, intelligence gathering. Okay, I'll have to uh, delve deeper to that one. I've not, I've not, I've not <laughs> heard of those those initials before, which is uh, okay. Yeah, BSSO. I mean, I'm intrigued. When you take over the role, mm. is there any feeling that the situation in Berlin's going to change? Does it? You know, you're, you're having a chat with the previous officer who was handling this. How does that conversation go about? what's happening in Berlin because there is there's obviously some changes going on in East Germany at that time yeah well we're, we're both rock apes we, we knew each other um you know and and we you sit down and chat and you chat over a beer and you chat at work and you have a handover takeover period of a few days um to to, to familiar familiarize yourself with the the job yeah so we're chatting away and we're looking at the the, the situation and and things are changing within the the east you know there's a different attitude going on you had the, the border in Hungary was starting to loosen up and people were starting to be able to cross it, um, not legitimately, but illegitimately, but it was becoming a lot more porous than uh, than what it had been because, you know, those borders were very strictly controlled. We'd seen things, rumblings in East Germany down the Leipzig and Dresden area, you know, with, with you know, just people just unhappy. But that just seemed like little grumblings there and, and you know, and, the hungry thing was interesting and it was probably the reason why there was grumbling going on down in Dresden area on that. But we, we got a chatting and we got a chatting about the wall and, and, and both of us agreed basically that the wall would come down sometime, but it would never come down in our lifetime ever. You know, we'd probably see out our days and the wall would still there, be there, but eventually it would come down. You know, there'd be a, you know, an easing of tensions between, you know, the Warsaw Pact and NATO and politically, you know, Gorby was coming into play with Perestroika and all the like. So, you know, we thought, you know, we'll, we'll see a change, but not in our lifetimes, basically. And then, lo and behold, a month later, <laughs> history smacks us right in the face in a big way. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> indeed. So, yeah, let, let's go to early November 1989 because I think mm. there's a there's a big British sector exercise and I have tried to find any information on this online and I, I'm really surprised I can't find any information on exercise grizzly bear so tell me about exercise grizzly bear grizzly bear was the uh the British sector exercise for the whole of the sector all of the Berlin Infant Brigade would practice our the war role. And for me, it, it was pretty daunting because I'd only been a month in the job, you know, coming into this really, or just under a month in the job. And we're going to have the major Berlin British sector um, exercise where they just practice their war role. And they'd go into the city, you know, with their chieftains and the armour and everything. And they'd go into the city and they'd rule the roost down there uh, and do what they did in time of war. So... We'd done the planning for this. Slight during it, we actually had a a young defector who just defected not long back, and a lot of us were invited to the uh, to the Olympic Stadium to the headquarters there to go and to listen to this young fellow. I think he was a young engineer, just a young private who defected pretty early, uh, and we all sat there and he gave a little 
basically a talk for 20, 30 minutes, 40 minutes about his role in, uh, in, in, on the East. And it was fascinating because I'd never seen a, an East, I think it was East German. I think it was East German rather than uh, Russian. So we had that and that was just before and all the planning. And, uh, we had a couple of O groups with the, uh, orders groups and, uh, and briefings with, uh, the headquarters staff. And on the 9th of November, I was taking stuff down to the Royal West Fusiliers. I was getting maps of the station down to a company to the boss down there. So he'd have all the information he had so he could come up and, and do his part of the exercise in, uh, in Gatow. And then I continued. I was working late in the office and I was finalizing the RAF's exercise scenarios because I'd write all of the RAF's exercise scenarios, you know, what was to be, you know, practice, how we practice it, what the assessments would be like, all the incident injects, the enemy, all that sort of stuff. I, I'd have to organize all that. So I was finalizing all those off late into the evening. And I think at about 11 o'clock, my wife phoned up and says, Trev, Trev, oh, yes, yeah, the walls come down. And I went, brilliant. That fits into our scenario brilliantly. Typing away like nobody's business going, this is fantastic. You know, it's because when, when you're writing exercise scenarios, you look at the geopolitical situation that's going on at the time and and you you base your exercise and that you base your scenarios and that and so yeah I thought, oh, that's great thanks jan yeah i'll probably be an hour or two and i was continuing and then about midnight i thought what the hell did you just say you know the walls come down <laughs> and, and i couldn't believe it i went you know it, it took me about an hour for it to really sink in because i was just so focused on the work and then the next day on the uh the tenth we were supposed to have had our final O group, if I remember rightly, for the exercise, uh, Grizzly Bear. But instead, that turned into a uh, orders for the reception of East East Germans into Berlin. It changed, it changed into exercise Cuddly Bear, by the sound of it. <laughs> it's an <a> astonished <laughs> bear, I think. You know, it was because everyone was completely and utterly gobsmacked. No one could believe it. It was. It was. It. You were sitting in the middle of of world history of, of epic proportions, especially when you come into the Cold War, because basically we're seeing the start of the end of the Cold War, potentially, at that time. But it, it was also potentially a dangerous time as well. You know, it, it was fraught with with difficulty there. But driving to the, uh, the Olympic Stadium the next morning was just extraordinary because all down the route, you had Trabants and Wartburgs everywhere with about five or six people crammed in all sleeping because they had crossed the border and they'd just driven everywhere and they were just slept up for the night. And then we just went from, you know, how we're going to receive the East Germans. Grizzly bear was cancelled, so that exercise was cancelled then. I don't think there was a, a grizzly bear after that because the next year in October the 3rd, that was it. We were unified and we lost our allied status and our occupying power status, you know, once we got unification. I didn't get down to see things until the 11th because I still had a working day because the 9th was a Thursday, so we had the working day on the Friday, and then Saturday, Jan and I travelled down to the wall, and that in itself was an extraordinary experience. You know, it, it was unbelievable. That that journey down was, was yeah, something else. <laughs> I mean, on that day that you had to work, on the Friday, did you see any indications of changes in the posture of the East German border guards next to Gatow or not? No, not at that time because the guys were still up in the towers and that they, they were still there, you know, for a little while afterwards, you know. So, no, there was no change in their posture at all. They, they, were, um, they were carrying on as normal, you know. They were probably just as shocked as – or even they may not have even known – with the wall coming down, presumably your posture with regard to terrorist threats has to change because you've yeah. now got a porous border. It didn't immediately because obviously that first weekend we had about 2 million people come into, into Berlin. Mm. You know, the population just exploded with people coming in, the world's press. Everyone wanted to come into Berlin that weekend and, and, that, and the next weeks after that it was just crazy. But... Yeah, the, the thing with the terrorists is that your, your IRA bomber or shooter is a very valuable asset, you know, within a uh, an active service cell. They like to be able to get in and do the job and know they're not going to get caught because they're, they're a value to the terrorist organisation. They're not stupid. They're extremely clever men. They're very dedicated. They are very proficient in what they do. 
very proficient in what they do. Um, and if anything sniffs as if it's going to go wrong for them, they'll just come out because they can kill us any day. You know, they don't, if it takes another week, doesn't matter. You know, but them getting caught is a big issue. And so for Berlin for them was not, not a good target because it was difficult to get into, difficult to get out of. Uh, so the chance of being caught are, are high. With the coming down of the wall, that changed dramatically because now, especially as it, it went on, it became more and more open and, and completely free to drive into to, um, to Berlin. So our, our terrorist threat ramped up quite considerably after the wall came down and uh, we then had a, you know, a different threat to look at and a more immediate threat than our you know, training for war. You know, we actually had a threat that could actually impact upon us and our troops. With the, the increased terrorist alert state, we had to look at defending our base, you know, about that. And, and that was for all of us, both the army battalions and, and Gatow itself. Um, and we had to beef up our main gate because we we're on a main main street there with the, down to Kladau, between Spandau and Kladau. And uh, so what we did is the Berlin Infantry Brigade had stuff called SIMO, uh, simulated ammunition. And these were one-ton concrete blocks that simulated a pallet of ammunition. And written on there was what the ammunition type was and everything so that when they were deploying on exercise, you know, like during Grizzly Bear, you know, the logisticians and that, they could put all this and saying we're carrying X amount of ammunition here and there. We, we clocked onto that and thought that would be a good way for putting up chicanes and barriers uh, at the, the main gate to Gatow. So we got a whole heap of Simo uh, blocks in to, to form a chicane and they basically a secure, um, a more secure entrance into the base so we could control ec uh, in, incoming traffic into the base more securely. Because we had both, we had RAF police, but we also had civilian German security personnel who manned our main gate and these were local germans who i trained up in weapon training on their their slp their pistol uh four times a year and they were responsible for the security at the main gate we also had a sanger built there as well where during increased times of threat we could put live armed service personnel in there as well uh, and a sanger is like a pillbox or a fixed defense position yeah yeah, yeah, made out of sandbags. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, people in the air force. The the your normal RAF personnel hate building sangers because on every station, as a part of a GDT training, or not a training, but um, uh, uh, preparing our units for war, we had to build defensive positions all around stations. So each of the sectors had loads and loads of sangers built, and they were built on exercise and with work parties and the station warrant officers work parties would have people building sangers and the normal RAF person did not <laughs> like doing it at all. Uh, so yeah, we had a sanger there for when we had an increased terrorist threat and uh, we could put live armed personnel there and they'd be live armed ready to engage any threat that came into the place. Um, we increased the training on the personnel for both by us in the regiment and also by the RAF police. Uh, because they had their own specialist information and, and training they could give for, you know, countering any terrorist threat. Mine mainly was dealing with things like routes, using different routes to and from work, um, your security outside, um, you know, checking your vehicle. We used to do a bit, you'd come walking back to your vehicles, you'd be looking everywhere to see if there's anything unusual you wouldn't go straight to your vehicle. You'd do a 360 around it to see if there was anything there. And then you would check every wheel arch to see there was no, not visually, but without your hands, to see if there's under vehicle booby traps there and underneath the chassis of the vehicle as well. And you did that every time you got into your vehicle. We did that for decades. You know, it's, the civilians don't realise what we put up with for years. I used to go in Scotland, I used to have many routes that I'd take to work and you just alternate them, you know, to counter that potential threat. Because there are many instances where people got into routine and they'd be killed by an under vehicle booby trap or be shot. So instilling that, we I used to build 
under vehicle booby traps the same as the IRA made. So you could show them to the the troops what they looked like and where they were positioned on that side. So there was a massive increase in in that sort of training in in encountering that threat and situational awareness and threat awareness for all of our personnel. But at one time, I, I can't remember how long it was in. I don't know whether it was in the you know, 91 or 92, but we got intelligence in that an active service unit was interested in 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 Berlin and may have actually been in Berlin. Uh, and we had we believed that we were going to be targeted at Gatow. As a result of that, we had <clears throat> personnel from one squadron RF regiment came up with other assets, came up from the zone uh, to Berlin and took over my hangar. I, um, we formulated a ruse of a serious gas leak at the hangar to cordon that whole area off because of the operations that were being run out of there. I was given tasks to go to the supplier to get certain equipments and that and trying to convince the supplier to give, and trying to get anything out of an RF supplier is extraordinarily difficult and uh, trying to get all sorts of, you know, even like the little, RAF DAPs, the running, the old white running shoes we used to have, because the guys that were there wanted to have stuff, not boots. They wanted to these for in OPs and buildings and that. Um, and that went on for a little while. Myself, my sergeant and I, we ran an OP out of the rugby club because it overlooked a potential ingress point into the, the station. And in fact, he got he was in there for one of the night shifts and he saw unusual activity on the uh the uh the the outer fence and called up everyone and suddenly everyone screaming into that location it turned about to be one of the a senior officer from the base walking his dog <laughs> outside where he shouldn't have been so uh which twitched my sergeant quite a bit but he got ragged for it for ages after it in the rugby in the rugby club because we both played rugby but yeah that went on for a while but i think because of the way the the, the terrorist operates because the, the German police were involved and everything, everything ramped up. The whole security measures within, you know, the British sector ramped up. And obviously those that were, if they were there, I don't know. Um, obviously it spooked them. They thought, nah, we'll uh, we'll fight another day. But, yeah, it was for us it was interesting because these guys had led a sheltered life for, since 61, you know, with the wall being there. You had people in Teberg who arrived there straight out of their training and left as a warrant officer, having never got, been in a tour any other place. They'd lived their whole or worked their whole life in, in Teberg. And the warrant officers there were known as city, the city fathers because they'd been there that long. They were like the mayors, you know. And uh, so their life was turned upside down and it upset them quite a bit, you know, because we imposed restrictions on them that they never had before. Uh, and that was a problem when the wall came down was our the life for those of the Berliners and, and those of us, those who had been there a long time, you know, Berlin changed overnight quite considerably. You know, my my fire chief, uh, he he lived up in Spandau and his, because a lot of Berliners live in apartment blocks and he had a the bottom apartment block. And the wall was, you had his apartment block, the road and the wall um, opposite Starken. And when that came down, he was most upset because all of the sand, because Berlin's built on sand, it would just blow into his flat. And he says, put the wall back, but make it twice as high next time, please. You know, so a lot of Berliners wanted the wall back because their, their city changed. It, it went really busy. There was an influx in illegal immigrants from the east, as in from Vietnam and Asia and that uh, came in, which we never had before. There was beggars and Romany beggars and there was crime happened and the, the city went dirty, which it never was before. It was spotless all the time. It was beautiful. But yeah, it, it, it changed considerably, you know. Um and a lot of Berliners resented the the change, I think, unfortunately. I'm I'm presuming that during that period as well there's things happening in Doberitz as far as the the beginning of the exit of the Soviet forces in Germany? Oh, there was, yeah. Um, that, was, that was unbelievable because 
obviously they exited over a while. I think it took them about a year for the, the Western Group of Forces to, to move out. But with the Dobberitz, what they did was obviously they had so much World War Three ammunition, whether it was the out-of-date stock or whatever they had, but they blew it up on the Dobberitz training area. And they didn't blow it up in small batches. They blew it up on absolutely massive scale. So when it first went off, we, we thought something horrendous happened because our my whole hangar would shake. And when you went out, you could feel a concussion wave on your chest from the detonation of just literally probably hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tons of munition, which they were just detonating in a single time. And that went on for about a year. It was extraordinary over in the Dobberitz there, them just detonating that stuff. And you and just hang it with you any shape. warning. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's still all part of the psychology. You don't get warnings for that. Yeah, the Russians yeah. never gave you warnings for that sort of stuff. They just did it. They were the masters of the place. Silly me for <laughs> thinking about something. But what like you, that. you did see was because it took a year for us before we could get out to the east, for those that had our brains removed. Uh, and when you saw the, the Russian troops there, you saw a lot of them were, especially in the summer, gathering berries because their, their living standards were horrendous in the Russian barracks. Yeah, it's nothing to see a barrack with half of it falling down and the other half is accommodation for the troops. You know, they, they lived in a pretty, even Berlin standards was pretty good, you know, because that was one of the premier places for them you know the further east you went the further the more difficult for them it became you know and they'd be there eating raspberries and, and blackberries you know out of the bushes because to get sustenance because they were in very dire straits but yeah it was an interesting time you then had a massive influx of um russian memorabilia and uniforms and medals and everything coming into berlin which all of us collected in massive quantities much to our wives disappointment <laughs> Yeah. Do you still have many uh, souvenirs of that period at home? More than my wife would want me to have. <laughs> I've got tons. <laughs> Uniforms, medals, books, uh, badges, loads of stuff. Yeah, I just I collected that because I love that sort of stuff. So I've got a couple of busts of Lenin, which you've got to have. You know, um, I've got a periscope site from a BMP. Um Sites from reco Russian recoilless rifles, all sorts of yeah. stuff. Yeah, all you all useful stuff. Then it is. But you never it know is. when you might need those sort of things. No, that's right. Yeah, you know, some of them keep my books up on my bookcase. Others, you know, <laughs> I'm there in front of the books, so I can't see them. <laughs> but yeah, no masses of stuff. I got I got loads of stuff. Absolutely loads. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think you're uncommon in that. From the no, no. That I speak to no. my only regret was I had the chance of getting an order of Lenin. Um, and it was about 600 Deutschmarks, and I thought, oh, nah, it's a bit too much, and I really wish I'd got it, really wish I'd got it, but uh, yeah, wouldn't have been nice with my collection. While we were still at RF Gatto and control of RF Gatto, we had the Germans decided that they wanted to do a an inspection of the base to see whether there was any World War II ammunition left buried within the base. And so they decided to do for the whole of RAF Gatta a one meter by one meter grid square search of every bit of grassy area or open area that, that wasn't covered by asphalt or buildings. And it took them about a year to do. And they found hundreds and hundreds, well, no, thousands of tons of munitions, literally thousands of tons of munitions. It was extraordinary how much wow. was dug up there. At the back of my hangar, I had hangar six, and around behind it was hangar seven and eight, which held Checkpoint Charlie for quite a while. And beside that, they found an old 500-pounder, British or American 500-pounder, buried deep. And they steamed the explosives out, and they were going to detonate it, and they decided they need a bit more room, so they dug down a bit more and hit concrete. They thought, well, that's not good. So they dug around and they found the roof of an ammunition bunker that had collapsed. And inside that was literally on its own hundreds of tons of everything from Panzerfaust to mines to small arms ammunition to grenades, all packed into this wow. collapsed bunker. So if they'd done the controlled detonation, it 
Checkpoint Charlie would have been in the Doberitz, you know, because it would have taken out the hangar. <laughs> but they took out, they, they did the whole lot. It was extraordinary, all with metal detectors, yeah, around the police club. I used to go to the police club often there, and uh, they had their barbecue area there. And the barbecue was built on an old trench system, and it was filled with small arms and ammunition, ammunition and grenades for about 100 metres. It was extraordinary. And that was the whole over the whole place. I was cycling down to the club one night and I saw right in the far side of the airfield what looked like an air defence gun that they'd dug up. So I thought, I'll, I'll cycle over. Then as I got closer, I could see a cockpit. Uh, and it's a very distinctive cockpit. It was a ME109 cockpit because I got that very distinctive glass-shaped, chunky square one. So they'd obviously dug up uh, an ME109 cockpit. So I got there and it was upside down and the steering column was still there and it snapped off the uh, the hand grip. Now, with the, the Spitfires and that, they used to have a circular hand grip for very rudimentary. The ME109 was like a modern hand grip. It was ergonomically Bakelite with uh, hatches and that. It had flick-up buttons and that. It was absolutely beautiful. And it, this was encased in quite a bit of sand. So I, I took it home and got a dentist pick and, and picked all the sand off and have an absolutely, or did at the time, an immaculate hand grip from the steering column of an ME109. Don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road if you'd like to help the project just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate the cold war conversation continues in our facebook discussion group just search for cold war conversations in facebook thanks very much for listening and see you next week